I'm here. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, this morning's tech talk is on dissimilar materials in plumbing. Um, very interesting subject, and you can actually go on talking for hours on this. Um, this is not going to be a science lesson. Um, I'm not good at science. Um, it's going to be more if there's a bit of referral to science, uh, we are just referring to, to get a better understanding of it. But it's to get a better understanding of dissimilar materials in the plumbing industry and how they react with each other if we are not careful of how we connect them to, together. Okay, let's just get that thing running. There we go. Materials of uh, materials or material combinations that are difficult to join, either because of the individual chemical composition or because of large differences in the physical properties between the two materials being joined. In plumbing, these materials are mostly metal. So what are the similar metals then? Different metals have different properties and most important that they are differ in their nobility. Nobility is how resistant they are to corrosion and noble metals are more stingier with the electrons where less noble metals give away the electrons much more easily. So is brass a noble metal? Well, let's have a look at the periodic table. We'll answer that question later as we go along. Within the red lines you'll see on the periodic table, there's actually a lot of uh, elements which are metals, um, but we do not deal with all of them. We are going to just have a look at a few that we have in plumbing. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, Mg magnesium uh, in anodes, and at the top right, we have aluminium also in uh, anodes. And then we have our uh, mild steel, Fe is normal iron, Cu for copper, Zn is zinc, and then we have tin, Sn, and obviously lead, um, a combination that we use for soldering. So there aren't a, a big number of metals that we use, but they do react with each other. And that is why we talk about the characteristics of noble metals. They typically resist corrosion and oxidation. So what is corrosion? Corrosion is when you have moisture content, metal and oxygen together, you will have corrosion. All types of metals corrode in a certain fashion. So usually noble metals are said to include silver, platinum and gold. So some of the scientists list gold, silver and copper as the noble metals, excluding all others. Copper, however, is a noble metal according to physics definition of noble metals. Although it corrodes and oxidizes in moist air, so we always see the green uh, uh, residue on, on copper. So it's not very noble from a chemical standpoint, but noble for the plumbing industry's use. So once again comes the question, what about bronze? Bronze is an alloy. It is a metal composed primarily of copper and approximately 12% of tin, along with some other metals. So it has copper atoms as well as tin atoms and atoms of other metals, which means that it's not an element. That's why you won't find it on our periodic table. But so does this mean it's not a noble metal? So let's look at uh, the scale that they call the galvanic scale. So on this galvanic scale, if you go and look, uh, it, it's actually huge and massive. And you'll see we have stainless steel at number one and at number five, but stainless steel is all over the show. Stainless steel, you get different grades, being 410 and 310 and 402 and all different kinds. And that is how they corrode and how they act to corrosion. Um, so we do not work with stainless steel, but you'll find it all over. So that is why if you are going to use stainless steel, some, you'll have to find out exactly the grade and where it fits in onto this galvanic scale if you want to use it for something specifically. But let's look at number two and three, bronze and copper. Uh, up at the top, and then we have uh, mild steel at six, aluminium, zinc, and magnesium down at the bottom. So why are we talking about uh, this? Uh, you're looking at, um, on the right-hand side, I've got an arrow there, red, it says more noble cathode. So your bronze and copper will act with positive electrons, and going down to mild steel and aluminium and magnesium, they'll be less noble, and they'll act as an anode for those different metals. Um, the further apart, the better those metals would be uh, uh, acting as anodes. So if we're looking at a geyser, for instance, mild steel uh, at six, that is why we have aluminium or magnesium alloys as anodes. Nobility is determined by how easily a metal gives up its electrons at that places 
it is on the galvanic scale in order of its nobility. So in the same environment, a metal like aluminium will give up its electrons more easily than a metal like mild steel, for instance. This ability to retain the electrons makes the mild steel more resistant to corrosion. However, to understand nobility and dissimilar metals, it's best to get a grasp of the corrosion process in plumbing. So dissimilar metals. Uh, if we look at the different materials there, we have copper, we have uh, brass, we have PVC, we have PEX pipe, polyethylene extrusion pipe, we have galvanized pipe, galvanized being uh, mild steel, which is coated with nickel. And bear in mind, absolutely, as soon as you thread that pipe, you are opening it back to the bare metal again. So that uh, part of the thread is then uh, normally mild steel, it's not galvanized. So what does dissimilar mean again? It means not the same. So if we are talking about metals being dissimilar, it means that they are different and not the same. So it, if they are different, they will have different characteristics of corrosion as well. So when two dissimilar metals, steel and aluminium, contact each other while immersed in an electrolyte, which would be water, and that is why salt water is a better electrolyte, and that's why metals corrode much easier if you put it in, in the sea or closer to the coast. The difference in the electrochemical potentials result in faster corrosion. So here comes another element, electrochemical potentials. So remember, when we are talking about geysers, there's electricity, there's a current flowing through it. So now we've got another element that will assist this corrosion. So it results in faster corrosion of the metal with a higher potential being aluminium, which actually steals the steel's electrons, but in the process protects the steel, such as with a geyser. So this is called galvanic corrosion, which is in this case a good one because now it's protecting the mild steel. So it's actually made to corrode. Uh, and that is the aluminium anode, obviously. So what causes galvanic corrosion? Galvanic corrosion occurs when two dissimilar metals are immersed in a conductive solution like water and are electrically connected. One metal, for instance, the geyser cylinder cathode, which would be a positive, is protected, while the other metal, the anode, is corroded. The rate of attack on the anode is accelerated compared to the rate when the metal is uncoupled. So looking at a sacrificial anode here, the blue arrow, uh, typical anode, uh, brand new, nice and shiny, and in the red arrow, the depleted anode as goes along and completely depleted in the purple arrow at the bottom. And that's what you'll find in, deposited in the bottom of a geyser. Um, uh, typically, if you want to see what's the difference, how you determine the difference between a magnesium sacrificial anode and an aluminium one, is take it, uh, put it up against your knee and give it a slight, try and bend it. You'll note that the magnesium one, you won't bend uh, easily. You'll actually hurt your knee. Uh, the aluminium one, just be careful. Don't go and give it a 90 degree bend in the store. But that is how you'll see which one it is if you cannot see it clearly or it's not clearly marked. So once again, let's look at the nobility of the common metals in plumbing. So now I've highlighted it uh, at number six, seven and number nine, mild steel, aluminium and magnesium. So that is where your geyser falls into in that category. So you'll have your mild steel and you can see aluminium is closer to the mild steel, which is obviously not such a good anode. So that's why you'll find that most geysers are, uh, come out of the factory with a magnesium alloy uh, sacrificial anode, but it's replaced with aluminium for certain reasons. Um, and that's why the further apart those two metals are on this galvanic scale, the better anode it is. The closer they are, um, the, the less efficient they are, but there are reasons that they have to do this. So it goes about the harshness of water and the hardness of water, and obviously being softer water as well, um, then you'd prefer to use an aluminium anode. So corrosion due to dissimilar materials not being isolated. Um, excuse the, uh, the photo I've got here is of a non-compliant uh, built up banjo valve or something, but uh, typically you can see uh, the geyser has corroded the bottom, being mild steel. Um, there's a brass, you'll see the brass is going green at the bottom already, and uh, the uh, copper pipe in between. And then obviously in this geyser, the aluminum or the sacrificial anode has now depleted and now it starts to corrode somewhere else because there is a current running along somewhere along the pipes and it goes and then as we look on the galvanic scale once again um, is that there is a, a potential uh, they are far apart um, and now they're becoming closer to, together and now uh, I don't have it on here now it doesn't come okay so what is happening is uh, the, the copper is higher up 
on the scale. So now it, it becomes a cathode and uh, your anode is depleted. So the next thing that becomes a anode is your metal. So the metal starts uh, corroding and now becomes an anode. And so it goes on. And eventually the, the brass being higher up will now start uh, acting as a cathode again. And then the copper will start reacting as an anode. And so it goes and goes on and it depletes all the metals as it goes along. What metals uh, and alloys should rather not touch aluminium? Avoid copper, bronze, brass, and different steel alloys, such as the die cast metals, from being in contact with aluminium. So here's a clear example with your polyethylene extrusion pipe, PEX, that is what it stands for, polyethylene extrusion. You'll see the red arrow, it's got a little aluminium lining all around the polyethylene. Um, and if that comes into contact with water um, and brass, it becomes an uh, anode and it starts depleting which will cause the lamination of the pipe. And that's why on the right-hand side where the blue arrow shows, you have an insert that goes into the pipe. The manufacturers has designed this insert uh, for two reasons. One for, uh, for the, is for the brass uh, olive that's on there so it can compress and not uh, cut into the pipe. So it gives it a bit of hardness. And then obviously that little O-ring there, it fits into your brass fitting that prevents the water coming into contact and also the, the brass from coming into contact with the aluminium so that it doesn't act as an anode and deplete the aluminium. So what are inactive metals? Inactive metals are metals that find great difficulty to react with oxygen such as silver, platinum, nickel, gold, and chromium. Silver and gold are used in the making of jewelry because they are chemically poorly active. So which metal is in its pure form reacts violently with water, for instance? Magnesium. Magnesium uh, in its metal form does, however, react with steam to give magnesium oxide or magnesium hydroxide with excessive steam and hydrogen gas. And interesting, you know, is that magnesium fires cannot be extinguished by water. Magnesium continues to burn after the oxygen is depleted. It then reacts with nitrogen from the air to form magnesium nitride. When attempts are made to extinguish magnesium fires with water, magnesium ag aggressively reacts by releasing hydrogen gas again. So it's a very volatile metal. But that is why we have a sacrificial anode. It, it cannot be pure magnesium for obvious reason because it will uh, absolutely go haywire in a geyser. So that's why it's an alloy. It contains magnesium. It's not pure magnesium. Um, and that is why in certain uh, uh, water conditions, your magnesium sacrificial anode will start releasing oxygen in the water. And then you'll know by opening the tap in the mornings, you'll see, but now it's the splattering and there's white oxidization coming through the water, then you know that this anode is not suitable for the area and the water that you are in. So how does magnesium, the metal link to everyday plumbing? So obviously an anode with, will then be a magnesium alloy and not in its pure form, but why does it react with water in certain areas? Once again, due to the hardness or softness of the water. So which is better, the anode magnesium, the anode of magnesium alloy or aluminium? Neither of the two is a better one. It depends on the harshness of the water. Um, I know some geyser manufacturers in areas where there's hard water, they supply it already with uh, the uh, aluminium anodes. Um, others uh, uh, supply it with the magnesium alloy. So be on the lookout if you have you replaced the geyser and your client complains about the uh, water frothing or bubbling, uh, it's most probably the anode and then it will be replaced with an aluminium anode and that would sort out the problem. Can you mix copper pipes and galvanized pipes? Um, no, period, you should not mix them. It, it's not a good practice, uh, uh, you will have problems. Um, but if you do have to mix them, in all the houses we have galvanized pipes, so what do we do then? Obviously you are going to use a male-female connection. Uh, brass is an alloy of copper and zinc. It provides a good transition between pipe, piping of copper and galvanized steel, which is coated with nickel. But once again, remember, as I said, galvanizing is nickel that's plated, plated onto mild steel. So once it's cut, you'll see the thread there, it's pure mild steel again. So you still need to, to get this uh, electrolytic effect to break it, the, to uh, minimize the current going through it. So the brass transition prevents an immediate potential difference between copper and galvanized steel, hence preventing corrosion in the long run. But do not use hemp because hemp will stay moist and that's how it seals because it stays moist and it uh, expands and then it seals off. But it keeps the mild steel wet. And as we said, corrosion, we need oxygen, metal and water. So just remove one of them and you'll get rid of the corrosion. So rather use the PTFE tape, which will seal it off 
and get the current the electrolytic current down and obviously also uh, keep the moisture away from the pipe. <clears throat> Why do plumbers mix galvanized pipes and copper? It takes too long to replace with galvanized pipes and requires specialized pipe threading tools and then they rather adapt to copper. This results in temporary fixes, but in the long term, it accelerates the corrosion of the existing pipe work in your home. This accelerated corrosion of pipes is called galvanic corrosion. Um, this is typically that we find is uh, uh, pipes being held down with uh, uh, mild steel nails, and then you start getting this galvanic reaction. And once again, it's uh, because one is positive, uh, acting as a cathode being the copper pipe, and metal mild steel being lower down on the galvanic scale is an anode and it is depleting. You can see the uh, metal is rusting, but in the process, it's also causing corrosion on the pipe and then will eventually eat through it. On this pipe, you can see uh, three different various areas where you had corrosion, but it was corroding from the inside because of some impurity inside the pipe. You can see the deposit on the inside. We have taken with a yellow arrow, I've taken a photo inside the pipe, and there is some form of deposit there. It could be metal, it could be anything. I don't know what it is exactly, but that has caused the corrosion because it's stuck. And that is why it's imperative to flush the pipes properly uh, once this is done. So how do you connect uh, various pipes uh, of different manufacturers together? Here we have typical, we have a speed fit fitting at the top there with its own pipe. Remember, pipes all have their own fittings. You cannot go and put a different fitting onto that pipe because it's been tested uh, with its own fitting. Pipes are always tested with a fitting. You won't find a pipe without its own fitting. Um, if it is a pipe without a fitting, you will know then it is not a non-approved type because pipes cannot be tested without a fitting. So once again, the transition between pipes, male, female, always couple. At the bottom, we have uh, brass and copper, and then we have uh, another manufacturer, Unitwist, with their pipe, uh, also with their own specific fitting. So do not mix and match fittings. Use the correct fitting, very important. So galvanized pipe, how do we do the transition there? Um, if we have to do a repair in the wall, quite easy. You can use a PVC fitting, which would be much better in a certain sense, because if it's in a wall, uh, you're breaking the uh, electrolytic uh, conductivity in the pipe there, and you can repair it, and it will stop the corrosion of the pipe and delay uh, and assist with uh, preventing corrosion. Um, let's learn from history. Uh, this is an interesting photo that I got. Um, it's a carburetor of a car which is over 100 years old made out of uh, different uh, alloys, brass and uh, copper. Um, and just look at the state of it, over 100 years and it's perfect. Um, and it's because uh, the science has been applied to whatever was done and when it was built and these metals put together and you won't find any corrosion. So what about DZR brass? Desinctification resistant brass or DZR brass, uh, it's also marked CR and DR, is the same as a name given to brass that has exceptional resistance to corrosion. Desinctified brass is a type of brass used for manufacturing some of our plumbing components, which give resistance to desinctification de de corrosion. So desinctification can be caused by water containing sulfur, carbon dioxide, and oxygen. Stagnant or low velocity water tend to promote desinctification. So you'll find it maybe on farms, especially I've seen on farms where you work with uh, brass fittings, they tend to corrode much faster because of the low velocity of the water and then obviously you have much more uh, elements in uh, in the, uh, the borehole water as well. It's a form of corrosion and weakening of the brass objects in which zinc is dissolved out of the brass alloy. So you can see on this tip, uh, typical fitting, a spanner has been put to it and it just snaps off um, and it just uh, becomes brittle. So how do we prevent desinctification? Alloying strategies to prevent desinctification is by decreasing the zinc to lower than 15% within the brass. Remember, we said it's an alloy, but we are not manufacturers. So the manufacturer is responsible to provide the DZR fittings within the test parameters of the set standards. So important for us as plumbers to notice when we buy brass, make sure it is desinctified brass so that it is has got the marks on and that it is an approved type because then you know that you will not uh, find this type of corrosion easily. Therefore, we as plumbers must ensure that we always use approved compliant fittings. By bonding of geysers, desinctification is prevented. This is very important. 
Um, and uh, we've had the question a couple of times, but why must a plumber bond a geezer? Because you are actually responsible for that installation. You're responsible for the corrosion taking place. You're responsible for the materials that you use there. So the bonding wire is intended to allow that faint current between the water pipes to bypass the copper to steel fittings and thereby prevent corrosion caused by the electrolysis. Bonding is used to reduce the risk of electric shocks to anybody who may touch two separate metal parts when there's a fault somewhere in the supply of electrical installation. By connecting bonding conductors between particular parts, it reduces the voltage they might have been. And then obviously remember, when you are replacing a geezer, um, the old bonding strap, clean it off. That metal must have a good conductivity. This, uh, the bonding strap must be tight up against the pipe. Otherwise, it's not working. Here's a typical form of it. You see on the stopcock, there was no bonding on this geezer. And you can see the copper pipe corroding uh, and the brass. So obviously, what is happening here is that the copper is now acting as an anode uh, and is uh, uh, the, the, the brass is now the cathode and it, it starts eating away at your copper. So what causes brass to corrode? Generally, brass corrodes with zinc, copper and tin components of brass alloy that are exposed to water. Corrosion in brass is easily identifiable by the reddish green or black splotches on the surface of the object as shown here. You can see how it is corroding slowly on that brass over there. So how do they make brass? It is basically a, a, a forming of two alloys, copper and zinc, uh, and they are close, they're right next to each other on our periodic table. And this is what it looks like in a molecular structure. So any metal has a molecular structure and made up. You've always seen in the science labs, you have these little balls all connected to each other. And now you have an alloy and it's all stuck together. It's nice and bright and shiny. You have your copper and your zinc in there in a certain percentages. And now it's a solid piece of metal. So now what happens? How does it corrode? You have the zinc being attacked and it flows out of the copper and eventually you get a, a, the composition becoming weaker and that's when you put the spanner to it it actually snaps off and is brittle so because it is now de-zincified all the zinc has molecules has flown out of this copper so if you look in the um, electron microscope this is typically what it would look like on the left hand side the yellow uh, side of it is where you still have all your uh, zinc in your uh, copper um, and it's nice and solid, and that's why you get the, uh, the color of yellow in brass. And on the right-hand side, you can see the corrosion that has started where it has actually flown out of uh, the, uh, the zinc has flown out, and then it becomes red and becomes copper again. So it, it returns to its uh, former state. So I hope I didn't go over the time there, Sean. Um, that's all for this morning. I hope you could have get a, a better understanding of uh, galvanic reactions and of corrosion because of dissimilar metals in the plumbing industry. Thank you, Sean. All right, perfect. Thanks so much, Marius. Um, we do have probably about a minute, and I think I've got about two unique questions here, so I'll just go ahead and ask them to you quickly. The first question being, um, so what about hemp and stag? So is there not allowed, so is there no hemp between brass fittings and geyser ports? Um, yes, uh, some of the manufacturers actually fail the warranties. Uh, I know that if you are using hemp on it, um, and it's it's just actually just a no-brainer. You know, hemp has uh, been the old traditional way of sealing pipes. But um, as I said, you know, it's mild steel. The the mild steel pipe or uh, female socket on the geezer is absolutely just what it is, mild steel. So now, if uh, you put water to it and you have oxygen, it will corrode. That is uh, that's a fact. So as soon as you your anode has depleted, uh, it starts reacting somewhere and that will be at the mild steel because that's the next port of corrosion. So hemp works in the fashion that when it becomes wet, it actually seals, it, it swells, it uh, expands. So it's always a continuous uh, moist process over there. So to prevent that from happening is if you use PTFE tape, you're actually removing the moisture, you're placing a barrier between the mild steel and the brass fitting so that you do not get this galvanic reaction and then the corrosion in the process. I hope I've answered All right, that one. perfect. Thanks so much, Marius. Uh, would you like to end off quick, just before I do? Um, all I can say, thank you very much for listening. And guys, um, remember, uh, in this time that we're going out there, uh, we are essential services. 
um, and that is also what we have to deliver in this time is uh, an essential service. So uh, moving on pit and Tani Sani's uh, prep bowl to the other side of the kitchen is not an essential service that can wait after three weeks. So just deliver the essential service of supplying the water, fixing the mains um, and uh, unblocking that sewer. Do not go out there and venture on uh, on plumbing fields that uh, are beyond maintenance or emergency repairs because uh, very stringent measures are put in place and you can find yourself uh, being locked up if you are not uh, just applying the strategy of essential service. So be safe out there. Remember you are putting your people at risk as well when they go out to these sites and let them have all the protective gear which is essential and uh, all of the best for the next three weeks. We will be on the air uh, from time to time still, so take up this time, uh, sort out your offices, sort out those vehicles at home uh, that uh, you haven't had time for, and yeah, uh, your wife will have a long list of things that you can repair at home as well. All right, perfect. Thanks so much, Marius. Guys, I will be ending the session off soon. Just before I do, please guys be aware that next week, Monday, for the Business 101 sessions, we are doing a trading during this time session, right? So join us, join us on Monday morning to find out the, everything about how to trade and what you can actually do during this time. Um, and that will be next week, Monday. If you guys have not registered, which I don't know why you wouldn't, right? Guys, you can, uh, you can just go ahead and email us and ask us for that link. And then we do send out weekly emails um, to everybody regarding those morning sessions. Other than that, guys, I am going to go ahead. Oh. Sorry, just before that, guys, on that, you can also send us e uh, questions now. So specifically questions that you do want answered about trading during this time. You can either send it to me, support at articulated.ca.za, or send it through to um, Kayla at IOPSA. That's marketing at IOPSA.ca.za. Well, uh, apologies, uh, IOPSA.org. Other than that, guys, Thanks so much for joining us. The session was recorded. If you do want to jump back on and watch it again, it will be on the IOPSA YouTube channel and on the app Plumber um, by about 12 o'clock today. And other than that, guys, enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks so much, guys. Bye-bye.